All right, thanks everybody for coming out today uh, to talk about uh, going big or going home, um, the story of large scale organic farming. Uh, my name is JP Ray, I'm co-founder of AgriSecure, the organic advisory service. And uh, with me today, I've got some other uh, large scale farmers as well. Uh, my family farms around 10,000 uh, organic acres just north of here in Omaha. Um, this is our, uh, this upcoming will be our 10th season. Um, that we've been that we've been doing it. We started uh, with 60 acres uh, and built it up from there over time. Um, and for me, um, you know, getting into organics at the beginning was about economics. Um, and uh, over time, it's become a much bigger passion um, in terms of uh, soil health and a lot of other things that we'll talk about more today. But uh, um, first off, I just like you guys, uh, you know, go through and tell us uh, kind of where, where you're from and uh, a little bit more about your kind of journey to in organics. Okay, I was, uh, well, I've been farming my whole life, but uh, went into the dairy business, and praise God, I got an avenue out. <laughs> Wasn't because of the dairy deal, but I couldn't stand the upswings up and down. And like before, my deal was my worst aspect in farming was marketing. And so um, through that, we've got probably approximately 13,000 certified acres. Some of it's grassland, uh, we're corn and wheat. And uh, we got a, quite a few dairies around us that we can sell to. So, earlage, haylage, grain corn. Um, we also do white corn, food corn. So, uh, couldn't have done it without bringing my two son in laws in. Though I need some young minds because I'm tired and old. <laughs> I'm tired and young. <laughs> <laughs> At least you don't look old. Well, thank you for that. Uh, my, my name is Ron Rabo, and I'm. Uh, uh, the president and CEO of Rabo Farms Incorporated in uh, southeastern Wyoming. So do we have anyone in here from Wyoming? Nice, one. That's the other, the, okay, two. So both people from the state are here, all three of us, right? So uh, I, uh, uh, I grew up on a cattle ranch, actually, uh, in the southeastern part of the state, um, fifth generation to be in Wyoming. And uh, uh, when I was 26 years old, I was helping my dad uh, wean calves, and I was filling a vaccine gun, and he collapsed. And I turned around, and he started to turn blue. I gave him CPR, and the short story is, is he did not make it. He was 58 years old, and uh, I found myself in business, actually, with uh, his cousins, who were in their 60s, uh, and my grandfather. And... Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm the one that broke the mold because I stayed there for four years and I told my wife, I said, anything is better than staying here. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it's, nonetheless, it's been a long journey. Um, we uh, ended up far starting our own farm about 15 years ago. We've been in the organic business for about eight years now. And uh, we had an uphill battle because uh, we've had to purchase almost 100% of our land, build all of our facilities, build all of our storage, buy all of our equipment, figure out how to farm, and figure out the organic thing. So uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a long journey, but the only way that our operation has worked is because we found a niche industry uh, in the organic business. And so we've learned that, we continue to grow, we continue to adapt, we continue to, to change, uh, because that's what we need to do in production agriculture. And so that's really the short of our story and how we've come to where we are. Um, so, Travis? <laughs> I have three boys <clears throat> who my wife mostly manages. Uh, no, act actually, uh, that's a good question. I actually um, have a couple other ventures that we've used actually in conjunction with our farm. So when you talk about building an organic operation, um, we actually started an outfitting company on our farm. And so um, I'm a big game outfitter in the state of Wyoming. And so we outfit mule deer, antelope, and elk hunts, um, not just on our property, but on several properties uh, around the, the county that we have leased. Um, I, have some, I have a rental business. And then uh, I also do motivational speaking and do uh, communication leadership training, primarily in the organic business and in family farm transition. And so um, I actually have uh, one book that's out. I have another one that will be released this year 
Um, it's called Make Your Own Way, and it's about family farm transition and how to survive in today's agriculture climate. And so uh, I think it's important, you know, when you talk about diversity um, that uh, in building an operation, that's really how we've done it. So, yeah, I've heard the expression, there's plenty of time for sleep in the coffin. Uh, I think you uh, espouse that, that, that philosophy pretty well. So, Travis? Uh, so my name is Travis. Um, <clears throat> I guess I got to talk after the motivational speaker, so that should be interesting all day long. But uh, yeah, we, you know, my parents, uh, my dad was born in the Red River Valley. We're from Canada. Anybody in the room here from Canada? Oh, there's more. <laughs> I got Wyoming beat. Not surprised. Yeah, so I'm in Saskatchewan, um, southeastern Saskatchewan. And uh, yeah, my dad came, started a farm in 79. Um, the irony is, is he was high input, snow till, like, you know, essentially he was doing a lot of what the current farm system is today, probably about 30 years ahead of, you know, a lot of people. And it worked real well because, you know, like you were talking about, Ron, he needed a niche, he needed a niche market, something that was unique. And back then yield actually got you paid. Now mm -hmm. that everyone can grow yield, it doesn't get you paid anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, uh, our family sold our farm, um, you know, when my dad was about 50, 51, because he wanted us boys to kind of stay home full time. And I was in university and single and just really not quite ready to do that. And uh, so we went off, did a bunch of other things. I ended up helping out on a project over in South Sudan to start a corn farm of all things, even though I had never grown corn in my life. And, uh, but I was still you know, the most qualified guy they knew, I guess. And, uh, and that really kind of reinvigorated a passion for agriculture and farming. And uh, ended up back in Saskatchewan. You know, my dad had a bad car accident over in Kazakhstan. And, uh, and, and I kind of helped out one of our, you know, sort of neighbors uh, take his crop off and started running a combine. And more or less, I just kind of kept saying yes to people that needed help with something related to agriculture. You know, I was, I was good at running equipment. I, I, you know, I used to tell my dad, I'm like, what do you do all winter? I'm like, there's nothing to be done with managing a farm. And now I am very clearly learning how much there is the price to be for done. That comment, aren't yeah, you? To, to manage a farm. So we, you know, we I kind of came back into agriculture in 2014. Um, started a farm. Uh, we started with 7,000 acres, so it was enough. It was uh, it was done in a crop share arrangement with a landowner that, you know, saw us break up and improve a bunch of land for him and said, "Would you like to farm this together?" And and that was kind of the beginning of the journey going back into agriculture. And I remember sitting there you know, across the desk, you know, we also, you know, um, were owned a couple of John Deere dealerships through the years. And, and I remember sitting face to face with, with one of the salesmen and him telling me how much a tractor now was. And I think that was, you know, I think he was saying 300,000. And I mean, now they're like 700 and some thousand. So it's getting more crazy all the time. And, and I think what really sort of shifted us in the direction of, you know, what would organic look like was, well, number one, my wife is from British Columbia and all she ever ate was organic. So that was almost like a non-negotiable. She rode in the sprayer with me once, but she said, <laughs> it made me twitch, almost. you know, like, you know, so, so that's been a, a huge influence on this journey for us. And, and then I think the, the biggest piece though was just the cost. You know, the cost of machinery was going up, the cost of, you know, inputs, fertilizer, chemical, you know, all that kind of stuff just kind of continued to rise, especially after the years of record grain prices, which happened, you know, I think in about what was that, 2011, 12, 13, somewhere in those ranges. We weren't farming, we were kind of out of the business at that time. And, and, and what I really quickly learned is, you know, the math just doesn't equate. You know, if you don't have paid for land, paid for machinery, and something that's helping supplement the overall business, you just can't make a go and you can't start something uh, from scratch. And, and uh, so we took an experiment in 2015. That was when we planted our first organic crop. Uh, 16, we were doing conventional and organic. And 17 was the year we decided, you know, we're not fence sitters and we kind of went all in. And I don't know if I'd 100% recommend that in hindsight, 
Um, Cause I, I would agree with that. <laughs> it's, it's been a steep, steep forced learning curve, you know, and, and uh, um, this last year we planted almost 47,000 acres and every bit of it is either organic or in transition. And uh, you know, we're, we're failing forward, but we're learning, you know, and that's, that's been, I think the, the most important part of the journey. So don't look at us like we've got it all figured out because that's the <laughs> furthest thing from the truth. I, I think that if there's one lesson from, uh, from this panel and, and knowing all of you guys uh, reasonably well, I, I think that's uh, something that we all would agree on is that uh, you know, even though we're doing this at a pretty big scale and, and doing it reasonably well, uh, there's lots of room for improvement. But mm -hmm. the good thing is, is that I actually have a chance to make a really good profit. Um, and, and when things do fall into place reasonably well, you can make a really good profit. And that to me is a lot about why we got into it because we kind of started this uh, back when there were high grain prices. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just saw it as, look, we're making you know, really attractive profits right now, but I just didn't see how sustainable that was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that today's markets are showing that there's some challenges with that. Um, you know, those markets were largely driven by a massive change in ethanol um, usage and uh, some short weather. And, you know, that I'm not expecting a third of the corn crop to all of a sudden get diverted into a new use tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think that the commodity economics are going to be challenging. So I think that's that to me was was, you know, the, was one of the big drivers. So um, but what people always ask is one of the first questions uh, to me uh, is always, you know, how do you deal with weeds? Um, I, just, I think people just don't really have a hard time imagining uh, uh, what, a, what, a, how you can manage it on any kind of scale. So maybe talk a little about what we, you guys do to manage weed and what your philosophies are around it. Sure. Um, of course, for me, like I said, I already, I already told you that I'm old. So whenever <laughs> I started farming, herbicides didn't work so well, whatever else. So I wasn't afraid of the weeds. And most time is on weeds is in, in my area, which I didn't ask, is there anybody from New Mexico here? <laughs> Not <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah, there we go. You guys don't count. <laughs> you had two that showed up also. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's I a did. pretty big deal. Sometimes we usually have a big late. showing wherever we go. Yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of that um, in our area. We don't get the rainfall that y'all do. We get, you know, 12 to 15 inches of rain. So I knew by tillage, it wasn't a fear. My fear was the certifiers. And I know I've kind of branched off of this question a little bit, but uh, the certifiers come. It's, it's like an IRS audit. And so that was my fear. And my fear the first year was I had regular conventional and organic. So I made the decision to go all organic also because I didn't want to have to keep two sets of rain. Mm -hmm. So that's where after the first year didn't go too bad, but then I got through a dairyman in Portales, met JP, met Bryce, and AgriSecure. Oh man, it's it's like having an attorney, <laughs> uh, your lawyer, and everything right in your back pocket whenever it comes to certification. Because that, you know, I mean, they make it traceability from the time you buy the seed to the you know bill of ladens for each load, each load, everything else, and. Their computer knowledge and the way they set it up was phenomenal. So that appreciate that was the plug. Yeah, that, that was good. That, that, that was my biggest plug. Out of hundred, but that was you know I, on the weed control. It's all on timing. You know, I mean, you get a rain, y'all get more than we do. It's you got to be out there looking every day. You got to know when those little weeds are at their minimum so you can do the best job at it. Because in our area, like Bryce talked in the previous deal our pigweeds will turn into trees. And so if we don't get them, mm -hmm. it's either gotta be physically hoed, and that's only 80% of the clean is that physically hoed. So then you load up for weeds next year. So most of it's just through tooling up and timing. I would agree that with that. I think that timing is really everything. Um, for us, uh, my primary, my primary uh, tillage tool is I have three boys. <laughs> so, uh, 16, 13, and 8, so uh, we send them out to the fields. Um, no, we have, we farm uh, a little over eight. I hope they work harder than my kids. What's that? <laughs> I hope they work harder than my kids. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty good boys, but they couldn't cover all this. So, we farm a little over 8,000 acres uh, in uh, Wyoming and Nebraska, and much like, uh, you know, we, we are at high elevation, and we have soar farming at 5,300 feet. 
and we get about 14 to 16 inches of annual precipitation. It's very sandy soil. And so timing is, is important, not just from a weed standpoint, but also from erosion control. So everything we do is in strips. And uh, it's because of wind erosion primarily. So my friends from Wyoming will tell you how much the wind blows where we're from, and it can get pretty violent. Um, I took a picture last year where my fields were blowing and they had growing wheat on them, um, and there was stubble on the strips, and the wind was blowing 93 miles an hour that day. And so it's just part of the nature of where we are. And so for us, tillage is our best friend. And so you have to be, uh, you have to go into this with uh, an intentional mindset. So you have to already know that it's going to be more labor intensive, it's gonna be more management intensive, and in some regards, it's also more financially intensive. Uh, because if your weeds get out of control, if you're a conventional farmer, then bring in the herbicides, right? Uh, bring in the sprayer, co-op will have something that you can spray down to get rid of that stuff, and then it will dry down. Uh, in our business, that's not the way it works. We have the same problems with, uh, with pigweeds. You know, you miss a, if you don't do one pass timely enough or your, your piece of equipment doesn't work the way that it needs to, then the next time you come around, even a week or 10 days or two weeks later, uh, the, the problem is exponentially better or worse. So, um, so we have a variety of tillage tools that we use. Um, and, and we have uh, primary tillage tools and we have several secondary tillage tools. And so some of those secondary tillage tools just include, you know, cultivators with nine or 12 inch sweeps. Uh, and then we also have some with uh, 24 and 27 inch sweeps uh, on there as well. And then we also have some bigger ones. And so if it gets out of control, which sometimes that happens because we don't live in a perfect world, um, <laughs> then we have this arsenal, this toolbox, so to speak, that we can actually go to um, to help control that problem. But you just have to pay attention to what you have going on. I mean, a lot of times, you know, when you when you look at getting into the organic business, if, if, if you're Ron Rabo, you say to yourself, well, I don't know if I can do that. But you don't really know if you can do it or not uh, until you actually try. So a lot of times, have you ever tried something where you thought about it and you thought about it and you thought about it, and then when you actually went and did it, it wasn't near as bad as you thought it was gonna be. This industry is the same way. So it's really just about putting your best foot forward, paying attention to what's going on, make sure that you have enough tools in your chest to combat the problems that you know that you'll already have, and then be proactive in addressing those problems. Yeah, I think <clears throat> that's, a, that's a real good point, is kind of almost foresight. Like I, I think the best advice we can give you is you're gonna expect the unexpected. Um, you know, conventional agriculture, and that's what I grew up in, we had very perfect looking fields. You know, you had, you, you, you've got to change your mindset and realize perfection really doesn't exist anywhere in nature except for all of these farmers' fields. And there's actually a lot of diversity and the diversity can be good. And usually if there's weeds there, they're just trying to cover, you know, they're actually not your enemy completely. I mean, they, they are, they definitely cut into profitability. They, they cut into yield, they cut into a lot of things. Um, so what we've done, like some of the things we, we're practically doing on our farm is intercropping. So we do a lot of, we'll grow a cereal crop with a legume. You know, we'll put a, a legume with an oil seed. Essentially, that's something that's fixing nitrogen. Um, and it's also, it's, it's good for weed competition too, because you're, you're almost intentionally placing competition with your primary revenue maker. And, uh, um, but there is disadvantages. You know, we did, we did some corn or uh, uh, peas with canola this year. And the problem is we couldn't do our weeding pass. You know, like Ron, we same thing. We've got, we've got uh, uh, shovels, cultivators. Uh, we use vertical tillage, you know, pro tills and, and, and other things like that. We've got heavier discs. We've got, you know, sort of a whole range you know, and we don't want to do it any more than we have to because it's expensive and it's slow. Lots of times it's slow. Um, we're using in-crop weeding tools like rotary hose, the Yetter rotary hoe. Um, we've got uh, tine harrows, which again is another weeding pass that, you know, in, in, in small, uh, you know, our small seeded crops, you know, it can cover and bury the weeds. It can pull out the small ones that are vulnerable. 
But again, it's, it's, it's interesting because you introduce one new management practice, which then creates other complication. I mean, this spring, we were incredibly dry, incredibly cool. You know, we were, we were concerned our, our, our cereal grains were advancing real fast. The flag leaf came out way before it should have. And then we didn't want to go in with the harrows and rough it up because we were concerned of the damage we might do to the crop. You know, we paid for that a little bit because we did have some wild oats for the first time in our whole sort of kind of, you know, long career of five years in organic. But, but uh, you know, so I, I think, like, it's not nearly as simple of a system. It's a manageable system. You've got to be willing to invest in the machines that you need, you know, I think around weeding. I think what we even learned this year you still got to go out and do it, even if you're like looking at it and you're like, oh, this can't. These plants are incredibly hardy and they've got incredible vigor, you know, and and uh, we because we did do it on some later wheat that, you know, this season and it came through it totally fine. You know, so I think, you know, the biggest thing we see is it doesn't have to be perfect because of the premiums we're getting paid for and the money that we're saving on inputs. You know, so it doesn't have to look like your neighbor's field. I think that's a mindset that you've got to mm -hmm. kind of get over. And if you can figure out how to creatively introduce a small amount of competition, that's, that helps, you know, just cover the ground fast. Timing, you know, like, like Ron explained, is everything. Um, and uh, you let the, cro let the competitive nature of certain crops, let them do their thing. Mm -hmm. enable that you know and that's 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 what i would say would be kind of the best advice we could give I, yeah i think in just to summarize a little bit here is what i'm hearing from everybody here is pretty similar to my experience is that the actual what it what you have to do to control weeds is not that complicated mm -hmm. like the techniques right. and the equipment that's a very solvable problem it's really about the management the timing and making sure you can get it done mm -hmm. yeah it really is and i think that there's a couple other tools too you have to keep in mind that instead of using chemicals to control certain weeds or, you know, we have a problem obviously with, if anyone in here raises wheat, you know that rye is your worst enemy, right? And so, uh, so we use a lot of rotator crops. And so um, we've gotten, you know, bigger into the rotations. Uh, we raise uh, uh, red wheat, white wheat, spring wheat, buckwheat, uh, proso millet, hay millet, lentils, three varieties of gar garbanzo beans, um, and, uh, yellow peas. And so you can take all those crops and you can not only, you know, help your macro and your micro uh, uh, nutrients, but you can also break some of those weed cycles. So if you're doing something different, now if you're in our neck of the woods or like Billy's neck of the woods and you're doing just summer fallow wheat, summer fallow wheat, eventually that's going to catch up to you and bite you. And so uh, when we're doing our, uh, our uh, spring crops, um, one of our best friends actually is row spacing. And so, you know, if, if you're planning, if you're on a six inch spacing with a spring crop or a seven and a half inch spacing uh, and you get, you do your, your initial passes well, you get, make sure that the soil temperature, that you're monitoring that. So because you want to plant a seed in the ground so it germinates right away so it can get ahead of the weeds. Well, if it's on a tight spacing, uh, the opportunity for that plant to canopy over that space um, greatly exceeds the ability of the weeds to take over the plant. And so there's just a lot of little things that you just have to pay attention to um, and use to your advantage. Yeah, I think the crop is the, one of the tools, like mm -hmm. you're describing. Absolutely. It's yeah. just seeding rate. You know, that's another mm -hmm. thing we, yep, we do rate. that really helps. We played with that this year. We actually lowered our seeding rate because we were trying to increase our protein just mm -hmm. from a marketing perspective, because that's starting to be a bigger deal. We're gonna go back to higher seeding rate because yeah. we feel like that was like a double whammy for us this last year because we, we, we couldn't do the weeding pass, you know, that we wanted to. And then because we did, you know, essentially a lower seeding rate, that kind of hit us even harder than it should have. And, uh, you know, so that's just from our practical learning, like we call it failing forward. I mean, that's how we mm -hmm. learn what works in our, you know, specific area. And we're, we're similar to your guys' rainfall. Um, mm -hmm. This year it was real lopsided, hardly anything early, and everything came late. We were snowed on three times before we got the crop off, mm -hmm. you know. So, so this was a, a year for the books. And I also think don't, 
Don't take the worst outcome and change everything because of it. That's what I'm trying to learn to do is be less radical and uh, try to be a little more conservative in the changes once you do find some things that work quite well. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like you were saying in, in the panel earlier, almost having those bumpers on the bowling alley, you know, so that you're like, oh yeah, that did work well. It was just this specific occurrence. You know, maybe it isn't gonna happen each year because I think mother nature definitely has a power over us. I mean, you know, the weeds are gonna keep coming. But I think it's like a good it point not. that you have to give mother nature and plants credit. Yeah. And sometimes what we do as farmers is we're trying to make that right. plant do something when if we would just let God do the work <laughs> and let him do the work that needs to be done, it's amazing what these plants will do. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible what they'll do. And so, you know, you can't, you can't dictate how much it rains. You can't dictate when it rains. There's, there's a lot of things that are out of our control, but that, those things are out of our control, whether we're conventional farmers or whether we're organic farmers. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, you have to learn to exercise a little bit of patience, um, sometimes a lot of patience, and I'm not a good example for that. <laughs> and so I'll be the first person to admit that, but it's, uh, it is, I mean, it's, it's, you have to go in with the expectation, not everything's gonna be perfect, yeah. but you need, to be, you need to exercise those patients to allow Mother Nature to do what Mother Nature does. Did you see a, a, a protein bump because of that blood? So, so the, the question was if there was a protein bump because of the lower seeding rates? Um, well, it actually, it was pretty much, it was very similar. So we also modified something else. We reintroduced lentils with our wheat you know, that's another thing to crop insurance and that's a whole other, you know, of what they want to, you know, sort of insure and don't want to insure and, you know, what they, they uh, you know, so we, we did a lot of it two years, three years ago. We cut back a little bit to kind of listen to them and then we realized that we shouldn't have. So then we went back all in and just literally ran without insurance more or less. Um, but but uh, I would say I don't think we did. You know, I don't, I don't think we achieved, I mean, again, we've had like literally pretty much every year since I've bought, like we had nine inches of rain over a weekend once. You know, we've had no rain till June, you know, this last year. We've had, we've had like, I think the, the only norm is it's not normal anymore. And I, I really think the resilience piece, like I, 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 uh, I think that's, try, a few things, like diversity is good in nature. You know, again, you know, God created this way and we've made it just fine this long, you know, and really chemical and conventional farming, you know, was really only introduced like 30 or 40, 50 years ago, you know, so, so, you know, what we're doing isn't rocket science, you know, and, 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 you know, as I sit and talk with my grandpa, it's amazing how much I learn you know, about, you know, this worked real good. This is how I looked after wild oats. You know, and this is what, you know, worked well together. And, and the irony, the fight was always, the things Grandpa did was because the price wasn't high enough. You know, that's literally, I think, at the root of virtually everything in agriculture, what farmers are fighting against is we are, we buy everything at retail and sell everything at wholesale and have absolutely no control anywhere. Don't forget we pay the freight bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but, but I think like this, you know, and this is what we're really seeing, you know, the size of our farm. I mean, we're selling, we've got a bakery buying flour directly from us. We have grocery store chains that we're gearing up to on board where they're taking our farm direct, you know, processed, you know, and processed just meaning milled flour, you know, and, it, and it's going direct. And I think like there's a disruptive opportunity that exists mm -hmm. in organic farming to supply, you know, every said, what about oversupply? The donut costs three cents different to be organic than not organic. She's selling them for $2.50 to $3 a piece. Three cents is worth supporting your neighbors. You know, and, and I think we just gotta take a lot of the decisions that we make as farmers. Just literally, let's stop labeling it and let's just get back to how can we control our costs, bring them down, and how do we increase the value of our markets? Mm -hmm. And let's listen to the consumer and then work backwards from there. And I think like that's mm -hmm. what's got you know, us up on this panel. It's not because of how smart we are or how creative we are. 
We're a bunch of warriors in the trenches just like every one of you that encounters new problems every year. You know, and, and let's just admit we don't control much. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think it's a humility thing. You know, and I, I think that's something as men, right, every man in this room should learn a little bit more humility. And let's just admit we can't control much. And then let's build off of our strengths. You know, and then let's let Mother Nature mm -hmm. literally have the last say. And I think God's looking out for us. So we're good in the long run if we're just willing to be open to that. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point that it does take a lot of humility uh, yeah. to do this because, you know, you're going to make some mistakes, but you got to be willing to, to try some different things. So uh, we've been ha having a lot of interesting uh, discussion here, but I want to see if there's any questions um, out in the crowd. So uh, Steve's going to come around with a microphone. Um, so everybody can. So Travis, I'm really interested. Um, you have your own mill. Do you have your own brands, and are you marketing them, say, at CHFA East, West, and, and, and at CL? Um, and same thing with the rest of you. Are you marketing those, like, say, at Expo West or Expo East? Well, um, so, so we haven't built a mill yet. It's actually interesting. One of our big wheat customers has a mill, of course, and because they haven't follow through on their contract, they're actually milling for free for me because that's their way to kind of keep me happy. And they're willing to also toll mill for us. You know, so again, this goes back to rather than build the mill first, let's establish the market. Because I think the most important thing is what we're seeing and we're seeing it crystal clear is the consumer wants to know where that stuff was growing, mm -hmm. you know. Exactly, we are. Yeah, so what we've done is, you know, our farm name is Organics Canada. It's actually, I couldn't believe that that web URL was even available it, to begin with. But I think, like, there's the opportunity. That sort of almost speaks to the opportunity that exists in organic, um, is the opportunity to tell a bigger story. Um, we've, we've started a food brand. My wife, Amy, is here, and she and Suzanne, you know, that's one of the wives of one of the other guys that works on our farm. They're building this brand, and yeah, it's called One Organic Farm, and it's farm direct, and it's impact. So we're bringing clean water to the, a developing country with the sale of every bag of flour. You know, you need what's, what's flour without water? What are people without access to clean water? You know, they don't even have a chance to have a future and a hope, right? And, and uh, so we're tying literally the farm story into essentially the branded product, We've got a bakery already that buys from us. We've got two grocery store chains that we're gearing up to onboard and look after all their organic. What also is starting to happen too, though, is they're no-name brands. They like this idea of linking a farm to the grocery store chain. And if you could give a chemical-free version and an organic version, then that's even more. Then they have a middle price market because then people can kind of, it's something to fight against this. Organic food is so expensive. But it's not, you know, and, and, and yeah, so that's, we are. We're, we're very specifically, I mean, we delivered yesterday and we were picking up flour and moving it to go get it packaged in small 2kg packages. That's happening tomorrow, I think, you know, so. Will we? I think we're talking, will we have a booth at CH? Um, yeah, so, so we were in the Anaheim show. We went to it last year. You know, a lot of it has just been kind of getting our hands sort of into the cookie jar to get an understanding of it. And, uh, but what we, what we chose, the reason we built it and called it One Organic Farm, because it's what if we all work together? You know, what mm -hmm. if something you're growing, we could incorporate into this brand? What if, you know, something some of the other guys in this room, you know, are growing what if we can introduce that corn, organic corn? I had a conversation with a cereal company yesterday. They're like, can you get us organic corn? Because we're doing wheat with them direct right now for crackers. You know, so I think like these doors are gonna start to open. And this is again, farmers gotta stop working alone and start, this is the humble piece. Yeah. We gotta start working together. <laughs> we gotta, I, I think that's an interesting comment mm -hmm. um, because people a lot of times another question, you know, is, is that like, where's this organic market going? saturated um, and I think a really key part of this is that up until now the supply chain downstream has been really really fragmented and inefficient and we're only starting to see um, you know more, the people come to the market to say we want to do this with it we want to do 
it out with it. Um, so I, I think that there is a lot more room for growth um, because it, it, the supply has been so limiting, you know, and, and not only in total production, but also because if you wanted to buy 100,000 bushels of corn, you know, 10 years ago, you, you had to call 100 farmers, you know, <laughs> I mean, and that's changing, um, you know, with, with the growth in the market and with some large scale producers coming in. So mm -hmm. other questions from the group? Yeah, I was gonna, I was oh, gonna sorry. finish that. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. I just don't want to make sure everyone gets their questions in. So we are working on that. We're actually working on uh, doing that uh, with uh, one of our buyers, and we're talking about facilities. We're talking about you know marketability. Um, we do a lot of work at uh, Expo West. Um, and so that's been a that's been a good thing. But really, what you have to do is you have to understand that this is a relationship game, mm -hmm. and 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 this is not about I'm going to raise a crop, and then I'm going to take it to the elevator and I'm going to sell it. And and but what it what it is is that you have to be purposeful with what you're doing, and so um, you have to look at everything bass backwards. So so if you're in Iowa and you're going to raise a crop, you're either going to raise more than likely corn or soybeans, right? And so um, for us, instead of raising corn and soybeans, or in our world, wheat and only wheat, um, and then taking the elevator and say, what will you give me? We go out, we research to try to figure out what the consumer demand is, because this is really about consumer demand. And why in the world would I spend time, effort, or money raising a crop that I can't sell? And so I've got to find the market for it. That's my job. Um, and, and so I find a market for it, I find a contract for it, I run the numbers and say, does this work? And if it works, and if it's profitable, then absolutely I'll raise it. So that's why we raise such a diverse amount of crops, is because we've been able to find a market for all that stuff. And so I don't know if we can grow it in our area, but the only way for me to find that out is to actually grow it. And not to just do it for one year and say, no, nah, that didn't work, I tried it. But to try it several years and say, okay, well, maybe that was a dumb idea. And maybe I need to try something else. Maybe I need to look at something else. But really, it's about relationship with the customer. So you have to be good at developing relationships and communicating effectively because the combination of those two builds trust. And trust is imperative in this industry. That, that you, as, as a producer, must build trust with the people that are buying your product. And so... Um, our, our website, and you can go check it out, is Rabo Farms. It's R-A-B-O-U farms.com. And so you can go on there and see how we're trying to brand some of our things. So we offer, um, we have facilities that we've built to accommodate our hunting business, but we offer corporate retreats on our farm. We offer um, an opportunity for our buyers to come in on our farm, stay in our hunting lodge, and have an on-farm experience. You want to know where your food comes from? I need to be completely transparent about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those things are important because that helps build relationships and it helps develop trust. And those are two things that are completely imperative in this business. Yeah, I mean, we joke. Like we, I tell pretty much everybody that tries to buy something from me, I'm like, I don't want to do transactional business. It's exhausting. And it, mm -hmm. it hasn't won for the farmers in the past and I don't think it's going to win in the future. You know, so it's relational business where it's the same people growing upon what they're doing. You know, you're all having a game of poker and sometimes he wins, sometimes he wins, but it's not the same guy that always wins. Nobody wants to play that game. And I think that's, you know, it's relationships that you could trust in the good and the bad. But, but that's I think important. it's a lot of work too. I mean, like that's Absolutely. what you guys are very clear about. It's, it's not like people are gonna wanna, you know, like, oh, hey, just take this stuff. You know, you're a farmer, you work hard, so here's more money. That's well, a lot of work. And, and you also have to understand that uh, that there is, uh, if you're purposeful in what you do, there there are uh, rewards for that. If if if, if you uh, if you put in the effort and do it effectively, um, but you also have to understand that any contract that is drawn up, I don't care whether you're in the or organic business or if you're even in farming business at all. My belief is that any any contract that is ever drawn up has to be good for both parties. And so many times we as farmers say, well, that's not good enough for me because you guys are the ones making all the profit. I need to make more. 
we need to learn to co compromise. Travis said it very well, that we are our own worst enemy as farmers. We refuse to work next to each other. How many times have you been farming next to someone and your neighbor calls you up and says, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, you, <clears throat> your tractor, you turned over three feet with a tractor tire on uh, my side of the fence. Or you bought a quarter and really that quarter belonged to me. So we're so busy fighting amongst ourselves all the time that we can't even focus on the things that are important, you know, the things that we need to do. And so the other thing that I think that, that, that I found challenging as a conventional farmer was every year I was like, well, crap, it's not going to work again, <laughs> you know. And so I actually went back to school after we left the ranch and I went and tried to farm on my own trying to figure this whole thing out. I told my wife, I said, I guess I'll just go back to school and like maybe I'll teach or something and then I can just farm a little bit in the summer and then I went to school for a little bit and I thought if, if I have to talk about my feelings one more time, <laughs> someone's going to die. <laughs> and so the, the, I'm not doing this, right? And so I thought I got one degree, I don't need two, surely I can figure this out. So. Um, so those are the things that we just have to keep in mind. That we, we, I mean, we have to work together. Um, and, and we have to make sure that, and I'm not talking about, I don't think either one of us are talking about just having relationships with your buyers. We need to learn to work together. We need to learn to cooperate. Those are all important things. We need to have these conversations. Well, I appreciate that, Ron. So, uh, let's jump over to another, uh, <laughs> another question here. I was just, I was just wondering uh, which crops each of you grow, and then uh, if you guys had any kind of plateau of labor versus the amount of acres an individual can farm, if that correlates to a certain crop or not. Sorry, what was the first question? What crops do you grow? Okay. Yeah, so it, where we are, we got a, a lot of cattle in our area. So you know, like I said, we raise corn, wheat, barley, uh, and uh, then some triticale. Of course, in eastern New Mexico, West Texas, uh, our labor force is not like you guys up here. We have, you know, through the dairy industries that are around there, uh, we can find labor. But, uh, but y'all were talking about the relationship, too. Uh, even us selling to the organic dairies now, I mean, you have to compromise. You have to say what's good for you and me both, like you said. Mm -hmm. So you may be stretched out 10 months before you get paid, but you get a nice paycheck every month or whatever else. So even with some of your some of your end buyers, I mean, relationships are key. My, both my son-in-laws and I, uh, we pride ourselves in going visit straight with whoever's buying or who we're selling. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, we don't, we don't have label and we hadn't started doing that yet, but in this business with us there, with the ranch, cattle, and then with us, we look at stuff every day. We're like, how can we, how can we brand cattle? How can we brand, even we talk about buffalo. We try, how can we do whatever? Because in the organic market, it's, it's nothing but skyrocketing mm -hmm. in all demands and in every aspect to peas, proteins, beef, chicken, everything. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we have uh, one of the, well, we have the largest shift from the lower class to the middle class happening in the next 10 years in the world. Um, something that's never happened before in the history of the world. We have more people moving from the lower class to the middle class. So what's the number one thing that people do when they move from poverty to the middle class? They eat more protein, right? They eat more protein. So guess what? Not all that protein is going to come from beef. All right, so um, we raise cattle on our farm. Um, I actually hate cows because I grew up with them. Um, and, uh, but, but we raise them, not, not organically. We raise them conventionally on about 6,000 acres of pasture, and then we have about 8,000 acres of farm ground. And we raise um, red wheat, white wheat, spring wheat, buckwheat, proso millet, hay millet, um, peas, lentils, uh, and garbanzo beans. And so... Lentils, peas, and garbanzo beans all are high in protein. Peas particularly are high in protein. And so um, that is the reason that we've started raising those crops is because we've understood that there's a demand out there for those things. And so it's, uh, it's important for us to understand as farmers, you know, I, I kind of chuckle at this, this big battle that's between Beyond Meat right now and beet producers 
and you don't really hear much from the Beyond Meat side, but you hear a lot from the beef producers, <laughs> okay, about how horrible this is, and this is destroying everything, and I can't believe that, you know, how could you eat something like that? Well, I have a couple of thoughts on that. One of them is, is that just because I eat beef, and now there's an, there's an option to, eating beef, to not eating beef, it doesn't mean I'm going to go eat it. But if I'm a vegetarian or I'm a vegan, now I do have an option. Well, guess what the primary pr ingredient is in Beyond Meat? Jello peas. It's protein. Guess who raises those? Oh, that's right. Other people in agriculture. Farmers, right? So, so that's about us being on the same page as ranchers and farmers understanding that we have to work cooperatively together. We have to collaborate together and say, look, this whole thing that people do in the world, which is feed themselves, benefits production agriculture. And it doesn't matter if you're on the farming side or it doesn't matter if you're on the ranching side. It benefits the industry. So we all should get on the same page and make sure that we're communicating and understanding the value of American agriculture, including Canada, of course. <laughs> um, I'm a so dual citizen. I'm gonna, so, I gotta, I gotta so, cut you off a yeah. little bit. I'm gonna say this is the first time I've ever been on a panel and not been able to get a word in it. This, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is impressive. So, uh, uh, appreciate um, everybody coming out. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, we'll be up here for a little bit, and then uh, AgriSecure has a booth um, in the trade show area. These guys have been hanging out there a little bit and talking, um, but then also the rest of the AgriSecure team is going to be there uh, too. You have uh, <clears throat> brochures that kind of explain what AgriSecure does, and also comment cards if you're interested in following up. Um, so please, uh, please let us know if you're interested, and uh, we will. Uh, you know, thank you for your time.